Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the first three months of 2015. And it's a series on the um, Book of Proverbs. And there's a lot of interesting stuff here in the Book of Proverbs. We've been looking at some of it, and it gets, some of it's difficult. We're not quite sure what to do with it. This particular section is on Proverbs 22 to 24, and in this lesson is entitled Words of Truth. It's lesson number nine for February 28 of 2015. I hope you have your Bibles handy because, of course, we wander here and there through the Bible. and We don't stick just with the few chapters in Proverbs. And so if you do have your Bible, I hope, and even if you don't, we're going to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to consider the book of Proverbs. And it's pithy, down-to-earth, everyday kind of language, expressing some great truths. Help us to see what is here for us, to learn what you want us to learn, and may your Holy Spirit guide in our discussion as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Proverbs 22, starting with verse 17, starts off with some fairly harsh language. We, as Christians, love to picture God's softer side, we sometimes call it. He's love, and He's kind, and He's gracious. But then some of us like to talk about God's justice. What is the justice side? Does God have a justice side? Does that mean he can't put his arms around people and love them? What are some other words for justice? Well, that's a good question because in the Bible, the word that ends up being translated justice in English is actually the same word that's translated righteousness. So justice and righteousness are the same word. That doesn't seem right at all, does it? Not in English. <laughs> in the screen in front of me, the right margin is justified. What would that mean? Yeah, exactly means it's straight. It's straight. We hopefully have the truth. So God's justice is how he lives right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's people, other people's um, concept of justice? It well, seems like you're talking a little bit different than what I hear. Yes, the, the modern equivalent is not equal to the biblical equivalent. Right. You mean the, the words have, the word justice is it went from, the, the word in Greek is dikaiosune, or dikos, or, or um, well, dikaiosune, or dikaio, uh, which is to, to be right. Uh, but when you go to Latin, that becomes justidia, justidia, and then we come from justidia to justice in English. And so in the process of going from Greek to Latin to English, we went from righteousness to justice. And it originally had more or less the same meaning. It certainly doesn't now. So justice means you'll get yours. That's what. By, by that's the common yes. uh, approach is that you'll get yours one of these days. Mark my word. Yeah. And um, that's not exactly right. That's or, not what it meant in the original at all. No. It might be true, but... <laughs> yeah, it could be true also. Some institutions of higher learning have courses what they call criminal justice. And then the, the, <laughs> it's, it's absurd. Yeah. I mean, it's a, in, then you have uh, the Justice Center, that, where they have the courts and, the, and yeah. the police and all that sort of, they call it the Justice Center of the city. It's, it's a, a distortion of, of what yeah. God is really trying to communicate. Actually, what God is trying to do is teach us the right thing about himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So God's justice, it's not really justice as we know it. We could say God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're disappointing some people. They're waiting for some people to get theirs. They're going to wait a long That's time. That's a problem. They might have to wait a long time. Well, they might get theirs, but <laughs> they <laughs> might not be the way that they think it's going to be. Well, there in that same verse in Proverbs, um, 22:17. it says, Listen, and I will teach you what the wise have said. Study their teachings. 
Does that mean that this next portion in Proverbs was not written by Solomon? Not thought up by Solomon? Somebody else thought it up? It says Solomon did not author but did compile this collection. Your footnote. That's what the footnote says. Okay. Is that what you say? Well, that's what it sounds like, doesn't it? So if you have a, something from an uninspired author that's quoted by an inspired author, does that make it inspired? Yes, the inspired author knows what to pick and choose. I see. So the fact that he chose it makes it inspired? I think so. Of course, anybody can disagree. No, what, How about what inspiring? Inspiring. Inspiring to do what is right. Okay. Well, what makes him the only one inspired during no. that time? No, but the fact that he wrote it down and it was collected and put together, or he wrote, collected and put it together, we take these to be God's Word. Logic, logical, mm -hmm. rational, yeah. reasonable. Well, there's probably a lot of things that are floating out there right now that's God's Word. Somebody needs to bring them in, compile them together. Uh, and add to Scripture? Happen? What? Add, would we then add to Scripture? I don't think it would, anything written right now could add to Scripture because, because? You, need, you need... It needs the, to be hoary with age? Yeah, I would say <laughs> that's part of it. That's part of it, and all the, all the trials and tribulations it's gone through to become what it is. Um, um, I think there's, there's something to that. So if, if Solomon borrowed, let's just say, for example, Solomon might have borrowed these from the Egyptians. Does that constitute plagiarism? <laughs> they didn't have plagiarism back then. Okay, so <laughs> in those days, you could borrow anybody's things and be fine? Well, it was like that in the United States, even. A few hundred years ago. Yeah, a few hundred years ago. They're not so picky with it like they are now. Yeah. You could take this to the ridiculous, like a physician who's an excellent physician. He is not an inventor of his own medical knowledge. He collected the knowledge from other persons, and he put it together in his own way to become an outstanding, award-winning physician. And did God help him do that? Uh, if he's an Adventist physician, maybe God did say, get to know this and this and this. So um, just because we put something together that God has laying out there, I think that it shows that God is helping. Okay. You're raising questions about the authorship of the book of Proverbs. In biblical scholarship, what do you call that study of trying to discover the author of a given work? Your Our criticism. Higher criticism is what is called in the in the scholarly world, and so should we be asking those questions? Should we be asking those questions? We better ask those questions, otherwise we have no basis in which to reject the apocrypha, the new the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, the New Testament apocrypha. We would have to include all those. Any, I mean, we would have to include a book I have at home in my library, and Jim has a copy. He he gave me my copy. Claims it was written by the devil. Corrected by the spirits. Corrected by the spirits, actually, and signed Jesus Christ. What is the difference between higher criticism and is there a lower criticism? Yes, there is a lower criticism. The difference between higher criticism and lower criticism, it's in, you think about it as, as a river that starts as a small stream up there and it works down and, and down there finally at the mouth it opens up into the ocean. So the higher criticism talks about where did this come from? Who wrote it? To whom was it written? Why was it written? All those kind of issues, you know, the origin kinds of stuff. Lower criticism says, why did he use these words? Did he use the right words? Are these the actual words that the original writer were used, or, or did it get corrupted somewhere along the way? They, their, their focus is on the, the words themselves some more uh, of, the, of the actual document. And the style, isn't it? They look for the uh, style. Yeah, it, maybe, it may have and something to do with style in some cases. change in the style. That points to the fact that somebody wasn't original. Yeah. So the higher folks are looking at the source of the water, uh, like a helicopter overhead, yeah. and the lower criticisms are getting down in the water and actually mm. playing with the water mo molecules. Yeah, sort of like that. Well, the higher criticism, they're trying to determine who was this document, maybe this book that we written to. What was the culture? What was going on there at that time? Why was these instructions made? Okay. And it, higher criticism has gotten a very bad name because 
people who start down that road seem to think that they have the right to say, well, no, this couldn't have been written by Solomon, it couldn't have been written by David, it couldn't be written, David didn't exist, or blah, 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 and they go to all sorts of wild and ridiculous ends, supposedly in the name of scholarship. And, of course, that we wouldn't agree with at all. Well, how about, what uh, example, Belshazzar, would that be, remember, they couldn't find a, yeah. they couldn't find a, a text time. for that name, and uh, then they, what, within the I've last got, 50 years, maybe, or so? Yeah, more or less, yeah. I've got pictures of that little cylinder that has Belshazzar's name right on it. And then all the higher critics had to sort of fold their wings a little bit and crouch down. And, and that's not just one. There have been many examples where the higher, criticisms, higher critics made all sorts of claims which have since been disproved. Well, thank you for giving us something to look for, <laughs> to find. Well, um, Proverbs 22.18 says, and you'll be glad if you remember these quotations, these sayings, and can quote them. Why would he say that? So you remember them. Okay. And what are we supposed to do with the wise sayings if we do remember them? Bring them to mind. Pass them on, pass them down. And presumably live according to them, right? Realize, okay, this is important stuff. Um, shouldn't they impact our behavior? Is that the failing of the Laodicean church, that we're not living according to what we know? What would happen if, in our day, there were Adventists who actually took Bible study as seriously as William Miller did and the early Adventists? There are a few. There are a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But remember, he was wrong. He was wrong. That's, that's true, but he... He gets an A for effort. Yes. He a for effort. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But and he did shake the world. Yes. And there's a reason why we're hundred more than 170 years later, we're still here. So I don't think we should criticize him too much. Mm. So what's the purpose of these, if you read verses 19 to 21, and I want you to put your trust in the Lord, that is why I'm going to tell them to you now. So what's the purpose of these sayings? So that your trust may be in the Lord. Okay, well, is there another word for trust? Faith. Belief, Faith. Trust. Faith. Yeah. Persuasion. Conviction. So, do these sayings, I mean, do these sayings convince us to trust the Lord more? That would be the question, wouldn't it? How would they do that? Well, I, I mean, that's the question I wanted to ask. How would they do that? They would only do that if they helped you live life and guided you out of trouble if they actually worked. Well, if, well let, let, let me put it in a little bit different way. Are these sayings true? Is the evidence we have from our daily activities, our ex personal experiences, are they supporting of these things? Do they suggest that what this wise man has told us is wise? They seem to ring true. Okay. But sometimes I wonder if maybe he says, put them in your mind so you remember them, so that as time goes on you will understand them more. It's almost like you get these, these things of wisdom and you may not quite understand what they are, but you hear them and then later on as you go through life, oh, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, that can remembered. happen. <laughs> yeah, well, right. well, I mean... What I'm saying is that you actually understand them more as time goes on. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, Susie Arman said you, sh you should never be a cosigner, never, never, never. And right here it says, uh, do, not, um, do not be a guarantor for debts. Pretty soon. Because be why should he take your bed from under you? Yeah, exactly. And that's the same thing Susie Orman said. So, uh, you know. Well, there's a whole collection of wise sayings here. Look at number two. Don't make, for this is uh, Proverbs 22, verse 24. Don't make friends with people who have hot, violent tempers. You might learn their habits and not be able to change. Does that sound like a reasonable thing? I mean, that sounds sensible, doesn't it? <laughs> Either that or you might clear away from him. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, obviously, when the Bible talks about listening, what what does that mean? Take instruction. Take instruction. Do we do Learn. we do you if you if you have the ability to let's say spit this stuff out by memory, is that all that you need to do? Well, if Live someone it. asked you what Proverbs twenty six say taught about how you should deal with fools, would you quote verse four or verse five? <laughs> That's gonna okay. make me look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's. I guess we should look there and have. Which le which translation do you prefer? Take your pick. Okay. Twenty six. You want to look at four or five? Mm -hmm. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what that means. Or you will be like him. Well, my version says if you answer a silly question, you're just as silly as the person who asked it. Give a silly answer to a silly question, and the one who asked it will realize that he's not as clever as he thinks. Now, that's the Good News translation. And uh, New Living says, when arguing with fools, don't answer their foolish arguments, or you'll become as foolish as they are. That's mm -hmm. verse 4. And then verse 5, when arguing with fools, be sure to answer their foolish arguments, or they will become wise in their own estimation. So do you answer <laughs> a fool, or do you not answer a fool? Good question. Good question. <laughs> Teachers have to make that decision every day in class. Do I answer this fool, or do I not answer oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I bet you never use that word. <laughs> yes. Well, let, let's 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 talk about serious things now for just a moment. Although silly things are sometimes serious, um, why are we Christians and Seventh Day Adventists? Have we carefully thought through that question? If someone stopped you on the street and just said, "Why are you an Adventist?" Could you give a good reason? Could you give one reason, or would it have to be twenty-eight reasons? <laughs> well, if you can give twenty-eight, that's good. <laughs> Now, when you what? say Adventist, that means that you just believe that Jesus is going to come again. Uh, well, that's what the word Adventist means. Yeah, I, I, That's I, right, and that's what you asked. Mm -hmm. If a person asks you that, mm -hmm. I believe that Jesus Christ will come again. Well, I've studied many different denominations, and yes, Jesus Christ is going to come again, but I believe that the Adventists have the proper interpretation of who Jesus is and how he's going to come just through my own Bible study experience. And, you know, you're, you're they can make their decision. Seventh day Adventists. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what you're saying. Everybody says Adventists. Yes. And no one Adventist. uses that word except Seventh day Adventists. No, they do. There they are, do? There are yeah. other people, yeah. Yeah. Adventist just means second coming. And there's a lot but I've people. never met a denomination that even mentions the word Adventist. Well, let me ask you this question. Since we're talking about a group of people who claim that they're preparing for the second coming, does the world look at us and praise God? Do you remember what it says in Matthew 5, 16? In the same way your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Shouldn't that be true of the Adventist church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, if you will? So how are we doing? Well, they well, praise think, us for eating peanut butter. I think. <laughs> Which parts of us? Yeah. I think we <laughs> believe in the Messiah. A lot of people in the world don't. There's a lot mm -hmm. to do. But uh, whether you believe the Bible or not, it is well recorded elsewhere. The Romans have got it down in some of their early records. And the records that we do have in the Bible are close enough to him to know what they were talking about. They actually saw him. Mm-hmm. You could say we keep the Sabbath because Christ went to the the uh, synagogue on Sabbath when he was, you know, within usage of one, uh, and he never said anything to alter it. Mm -hmm. There's another reason you could bring in the great controversy right yeah. there. Yeah. Well, Adventists, when they were first starting out as a church, published a paper called The Present Truth. What does present truth imply? I mean, it's different today than it was yesterday? It means that you haven't arrived yet. 
Does present truth mean the truth that needs to be presented to today's people? It's got two or three meanings. Mm -hmm. You could say the truth as they saw it at the time, and then you could use that later. Well, it, 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 the term got dropped, but present's got two or three shades of meaning there. Okay. I mean, in the present truth for what, um, who are the two people that built the um, wall around Jerusalem? Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah and Ezra? Yeah, the present truth for Nehemiah and Ezra is to get this wall built. Mm -hmm. yeah. The present truth for today is let the Sabbath be known and the message of the sanctuary and that Jesus is coming. I mean, the present truth, I think, depends on what is pressing at the moment, right? Situation there. Now, now, when you had the Great Disappointment, 1844, you had these, this group of people that sat down and they studied. Mm -hmm. w weren't they trying to change present truth because the old truth didn't work? Well, they were convinced that what they were being taught as truth wasn't. Yeah. So well, they said, we better find out for ourselves. Okay, so... Right at that point, before they started, they were heading towards this present truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know, when I have read that for the first time, I always thought that truth was always going forward. That we don't have the exact answers, that they're always being tweaked as yeah. time goes on, mm -hmm. type of thing. And I'm not scared of things being off a little bit. Um, okay. Well, let's take an example from the early church. When the great disappointment happened, all of them were worshiping on Sunday. There was no Seventh-day worshipers at the time of the great disappointment. Mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, people like Joseph Bates and some others brought in the idea that we should be worshiping on the Sabbath. And people slowly started to ad adapt that. And, but then they said, well, at the beginning they said, okay, Sabbath begins at 6 p.m., on Friday night and it ends at 6 p.m. on Saturday night. And they did that for a while. And then they said, well, no, even isn't, doesn't, doesn't designate 6 p.m. Even means sunset. And finally they said, well, no, the truth is that we start Sabbath at sunset and then we end Sabbath at sunset. So there was present truth. Well, William Miller thought that present truth was that Jesus would come in 1843. Yeah. So how did we get to 1844? Well, because he decided he'd miscalculated. And would it be the spring of 44 or the fall of 44? He decided miscalculated again. He ended, he ended up saying that it was supposed to be on the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur of 1844. I think now, it was Samuel Snow who advanced that theory. And he suggested that not all Jews, but a, a small sect of Jews, would celebrate Yom Kippur on the 22nd of October. Mm -hmm. But most Jews were celebrating Yom Kippur on September 23. And if you go to the only Karaite website today, it says that they too celebrated Yom Kippur on September 23 that year. How should we respond to that? <laughs> Sounds like somebody was confused. <laughs> well, we have a real dilemma today. <clears throat> Is present truth um, <clears throat> women's ordination? Or is women's ordination presenting strange fire to God against his way? Wow. See, this, this is a real dilemma. We have to be careful with present truth yeah. because it can lead us into error. Uh, we have to debate it and figure it out as a whole and not as little fractions doing this and this because I think you decide and work together, right? Whenever there's present truth. What is the biblical so, uh, source of the idea of Ordination. Is there, any, is there any admonition from the Bible? For, well, for? no. Uh, I didn't mean for us to get on this yeah. hot topic, but <laughs> well, that's the present to truth we're struggling with now. Yeah. No. But you could call the signs of the times a present truth, too. There's a broader aspect to yeah. it. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that Proverbs, this section of Proverbs talks about is widows and orphans and how we should treat them. Now, I think all of us who have something of a Christian perspective shouldn't have any question about how we should treat widows and orphans, right? What about this from James? 
what God the Father considers, this is James 1, 27, what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. So you only have to do two things to be pure and genuine, have pure and genuine religion? Well, if you did those two things, you would probably fill in a lot of other stuff too, when you think. We'd sort of be consistent with that? Yeah. So we talked about atheists earlier. Might it be that atheists would also take care of widows and orphans? They might. Yes, yes. Well, if we try to cheat orphans of the poor, Proverbs says, God will be against you. Do we want to find ourselves fighting against God? That doesn't sound like a good thing to be doing, does it? Um, would it be correct in la that light to say that robbing the poor is not just a criminal act, it's a sin against the Lord? All sin is sin against God, correct? Well, remember what Joseph said when he was tempted to have an affair with Potiphar's wife? How can I do this terrible sin and sin against God? Sin against God? What does that mean? Also, David said, I have sinned against God. Mm -hmm. You know, it all kind of works as being consistent with God. Sin mm -hmm. is not being consistent with God. Okay. This isn't the way God would do it. Now, if we look at the world around us, we find that the majority seem to be following the easy path. The path that we would describe as Christians, we would call it you know, the broad way, the path that leads to destruction. Why is that way attractive? Some people do not see any hope in waiting. If they don't grab it now, they have their life has proven they never will have it. So if they see something, they steal it now because they can't see a job, them getting a job and saving money and it being able to, I think they're yeah. desperate sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a tendency to go with the crowd. Mm -hmm. All of us do. We kind of have to deal with that somehow. Would it be correct to say that Satan always wants us to focus on the immediate gains? He's, he never wants us to think about the long-term consequences. Why would that be? Are the, are the long-term consequences ever in his favor? I don't think so. <laughs> Not likely. What's your definition of long-term? Well, the He's longer, pretty patient the longer better. <laughs> the the long-term would be places like Revelation 20, where it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, alike standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the Book of the Living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead, death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. That's about as long term as you can get. Okay. I, th I thought you were talking about something a little shorter than that, <laughs> like even, even within our lives okay. that we can you know, do the things that may not pay off very quickly. Uh, that kind of thing, but I think you talked about the ultimate there. Yeah. Well, a while back, the some athe an atheist group in London sponsored a some buses. Not all the buses, but some of the buses in London had written on big plaster on the side of the buses. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Does that sound like a good idea? Well, there's some implications there yeah. that, that God would be a killjoy. Yes. And I think we would reject that. Okay. Also, the fact that they say probably no God means they probably were not atheists. They yes. may have been agnostics instead. Yes. So it may have been mislabeled. I, I think I heard that he was going to put there was no God, but then they argued with him and said that a person who's looking for the truth would never cut everything out completely. And so the probably got stuck in. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. I, I heard that too. too. John, yeah. John 16, excuse me, John 15, 16, and 17 says Jesus came and with his message so that you can have joy now. Mm -hmm. It talks about enjoy over there on mm -hmm. that. 
Yeah. So. Well, these people say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yeah. And we know that's straight out of the Bible. Once upon a time, a fellow named Morris Venon was asked to give his first commencement sermon. <laughs> and it happened to be at a kindergarten. And so <laughs> he asked these kids, now, if I gave you a choice, I gave you $100 when you're 21, or I gave you 25 cents now, which, which would you choose? Think carefully now, consider the implications. Every last one of them wanted the 25 cents now. Yeah. So he asked them why. Well, they explained, $100 is a lot of money, but then 21 is a many years ahead. If, if I had the quarter now, I could get some gum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, if, if that's normal for kindergartners, is that normal for the rest of us? So, and the most, I mean, w there's no question about the fact that if you look at the media and so forth in our world, they want to put God out of their thinking. Why is that? They don't want to think. Uh, it <laughs> they might, just go uh, for the eyes, eyes and uh, it now. It worry them. <laughs> you know that and, was a loaded question. And pe yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so why do people want to avoid responsibility? Because really that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Consequences. Mm -hmm. what, would, what, would, what would a Peter or a Paul or a, let's say a Stephen do? Today? Who knows? <laughs> what would they do? You mean how would they talk to people or reach people? Well, it, assuming they would, that would be their goal, yeah. What would they, I mean, these guys just took off. I mean, they, they didn't ask any questions. They didn't ask about money. They didn't ask about sponsorship. They didn't know, they didn't ask about a 401k. They just said, here we go, God. I think we have some people like that today. Mm -hmm. What they called what they were doing sh shedding good news. Mm -hmm. And if you have good news to share, it's not difficult. You just do it. Mm -hmm. It's if you think you have bad news that it's difficult to share. I see. So are we, are we doing a fair job at sharing the good news? But I think things have changed just a little bit. You had to do something like a capital crime or whatever to get a ancient Rome wanting to put you up on a, mm -hmm. a cross. Uh, there was, it was more agrarian. You could probably jump right in. These days, I'm not quite so sure. And like in the conditions we live in right here, mm -hmm. you can do it, but in certain parameters, you've got to be a little careful too. And I'm not trying to put the damper on anything. Uh, Do you think Paul wondered, if I walk down the street, I could be arrested by Nero and I could be put to death, so I better not do that? Apparently he wasn't too concerned about it because well, he what, arrested so many times. Stephen? What about Stephen? Yeah. I, I, I know they put their necks literally on the line, but these days if you stand on the street corner for too long, the cops are going to move you, and if you keep it up, you'll end up in the tank. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little quicker than what I'm, I'm seeing a broader picture. Yes, they walked and they shared the me their message with probably a lot of people we've never heard about that we might meet yep. in heaven. Yeah. Well, what about this verse? What, what do we do with Proverbs 23, verse 17? Don't be envious of sinful people. Let reverence for the Lord be the concern of your life. If it is, you have a bright future. Why would anyone be envious of sinful people? Do sinful people have more fun? Well, there's a lot of uh, singers, actors, actresses that are um, sinful people, athletes, and people are um, envious of them because of their money, their prestige, their status, their looks, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Proverbs 24, for the first couple of verses, says something similar. Don't be envious of evil people, and don't try to make friends with them. Causing trouble is all they ever think about. Every time they open their mouth, someone is going to get hurt. Yes, and a lot of these actors and actresses and athletes end up violently dead, suicide, and different things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like they're advertised as a good thing to be. 
I mean, they are advertised that way. And I think Solomon's just saying, don't believe the advertising. Mm -hmm. Don't believe it. Mm -hmm. What What is our attitude about our favorite sin or sins? Do we really detest the sin itself, or do we just wish that we could go on with the sinning and not suffer the consequences? What is a favorite sin? I just, I can't conceive that. Would that be like smoking or alcohol for some people, or gambling? For some people. I mean, even people. if you smoked, you'd probably hate doing it. So why would that be your favorite sin, even though you're doing it? If there were no adverse consequences, would it be a sin? Well, that's still not my question. How do you, <laughs> how do you come up with a favorite sin? How about gambling? <laughs> I mean, well, it's sin. It's it's just like coming up with your drinking. favorite death. You know, how do you how do you do that? Well, well but they don't think about it. Is <laughs> is a favorite death? Well, that's what they're sin gambling, is. They're it's drinking, a death. They're... But it's it's not looked at as a death well, right then. Let, let's let's take the really popular things: selfishness. Mm -hmm. Selfishness. Mm -hmm. You know that anybody, even Jesus Christ, could be accused of selfishness. Well, it's not a question of whether he could be accused. Well, you can be accused of anything. It's a question, is it true? Well, it's, it's still selfishness is not that easy to define. Correct. The Bible suggests, and Ellen White picks this up as well, how do we learn to hate sin because it is sin? What, what is implied by that idea? Well, first of all, you understand it. To be okay. seen. I think it suggests something else that we've already understood that sin is by definition destructive. Mm -hmm. We don't like destruction. So how would that ever be a favorite thing? If it was understood it wouldn't be a favorite. It would be abhorrent. Okay. Yeah, you're right about that. Well some sins don't really have consequences. Like I have a relative, elderly, they take all the elderly people to bingo and, and they take them to these gambling places. And what if they win? They're having fun. They don't consider it a sin. It's a joy. They don't lose that much money. My mother grew up in a little town not too far from Reno, Nevada. She, she was born there. My, my grandfather homesteaded there. Had a nice little farm. And one time my parents were, I think, traveling by bus. And these were the way back in those days, through, through uh, Reno to, to head for their place. And they met a lady who was there gambling, and so they started asking her some questions. She was an old, retired lady, and so she said this is what she did. Every day, she, would, she lived out on the outskirts of Reno. Every day, she would take $20. And this is in the days when $20 was a significant amount of money. She would take $20, and she would go into one of the gambling places, and she would gamble until the $20 was gone, and then she would go home. Mm -hmm. That's what you did every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when she went home, it was always gone. <laughs> it was always gone. <laughs> so and obviously anything she won, she would keep gambling until it was gone. Then she'd because go it is true that if you gamble long enough, you will always lose. Mm -hmm. So my favorite atheist named Carl Sagan said that gambling is a tax on those who do not understand mathematics. Uh, <laughs> that's right. And think of how Satan uses that to keep you from doing good works, to keep you from doing other things. Okay, now we've had some questions about favorite sins. Gary's not sure, uh, obviously maybe he's the only saint among us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just... I just Trying to figure out the concept. That's yeah. Okay. What, what do you mean by that? So many Christians in our day want to emphasize the fact that God is forgiving, and why do they want to emphasize that? They can do what they want and then go. So out they can go back, back and do it again, and God forgives, and they go back and do it again, and God forgives, and they go back and do it again, and God forgives, right? Well, He is forgiving. Well. Well, about but thirty it, years ago, there was a, a famous TV preacher who says he did whatever it is under the blood. He sinned under the blood, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and what his, that? his favorite sin was with prostitutes down in Palm Springs. <laughs> yes, and he's back on the TV again too. Probably yes. once saved, always saved. Yeah. Nothing you can do will unsave you. Unsave you. <laughs> that is taught today. Oh, actively. Well. 
Is there a point where God won't forgive? Let me let forgiveness well, isn't no. the issue. Everybody's forgiven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah well, one of, one of the we're talking about favorite sins. Gary, here's your here's here's <laughs> a definition. One of the favorite sins, or one of the greatest sins in the developed world in our day, is overindulgence and appetite. You think some people have that as a favorite sin? Yeah, that's a, that's a favorite sin. Okay, can you can you um, wind that into the Ten Commandments somewhere? Because you got to be breaking the law. Oh yeah, it's yeah. not in the yeah. Ten. It's it's in the Seven Deadly Sins. Gluttony is one of them. Seven Deadly Sins. Yes. Where where is that in the Bible? It's not. <laughs> it <is laughs> okay, you're just Christian making tradition, it up. Yes. Okay. You know, well, a lot of churches I, would say um, there's nothing the Bible says about um, overeating or too many desserts or. Well, but I can tell you as a physician mm -hmm. that the people that I see almost every day, I need to keep telling them that overeating and in some cases over drinking is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. And I mean, I just spent a long time today talking to an elderly lady who has, was getting all the consequences of diabetes. And she just, I, I'm not sure we convinced her at all that there was any reason why she should change her lifestyle. My eye just fell on it. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, mm -hmm. and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. Well, I know a lot of overeaters that don't eat meat and they don't eat wine, drink wine. So you don't have, We're not talking about <laughs> what you eat in this case. We're just talking about the quantity. Quantity, yes, and the choices. The quantity. Yes. Okay, so what's, what's the point of all this? Well, I'm just saying that it is, is eating too much food until you finally kill yourself, is that a sin? Yeah, because your body's not your own. That was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, one of them, one of wasn't them. it? I, liked, I still like to have it somehow be zeroed in on one of the Ten Commandments somewhere for it to be a sin. Well, I, I gave you. I said it's wrong to kill people, including yourself. Okay. Okay, that's, that's a good way to it's, do it's it. But, you know, the problem is we're all going to die anyway. Yeah, so you can why, do why something you? to, to, to so make, your, right. make your life two seconds shorter. And so would right that be a death? Okay. Would that be so breaking the if, if I take your logic, I'll say it's all right for me to take a gun and shoot you because you're going to die anyway. Well, that's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, but the thing is, the thing is, um, I, uh, having a gun and eating too much is a little different. If I could, oh, it's, it's if I could quote or misquote Jack Provencia, he said it's not, <laughs> it's not a sin to be sick, but it's a sin to be sicker than you need to be. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, because here's an example. You, because you will die. One of the favorite passages in these particular chapters we're studying right now is, is Proverbs 23 verses 29 to what, 35. Show me someone who drinks too much, who has to try out some new drink, and I will show you someone miserable and sorry for himself, always causing trouble and always complaining. His eyes are bloodshot and he has bruises that could have been avoided. Don't let wine tempt you, even though it is rich red, though it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. The next morning you will feel as if you have been bitten by a poisonous snake. Weird sights will appear before your eyes, and you will not be able to think or speak clearly. You will feel as if you were out on the ocean, seasick, swinging high up in the rigging of a tossing ship. I must have been hit, you will say. I must have been beaten up, but I don't remember it. Why can't I wake up? I need another drink. <laughs> that, that just to me proves. Is that in the Proverbs? That's Proverbs. They had the DTs way back then. Oh, yes, they certainly did. The DTs? Delirium tremens. When yeah. you get drunk, that's when you see spiders on the wall hopping off to come and get you and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it's very real and they die. Yeah, Ellen White good. expanded on that point. She said in SDA Bible Commentary, her comments, volume 3, page 1162, the man who has formed the habit of drinking intoxicating liquor is in a desperate situation. He cannot be reasoned with or persuaded to deny, deny himself the indulgence. So that would be his favorite sin, I think. His stomach and brain are diseased, his willpower is weakened, and his appetite uncontrollable. The prince of the powers of darkness holds him in bondage that he has no power 
to break. So we've referred to Proverbs 23, which is one of our favorites. What about Proverbs <laughs> 31? Yeah. So you, you want me to you want to get me into trouble here? Yeah. Uh, let's look at let's look at Proverbs 31. What do we do with? Um, As a medical doctor, doesn't alcohol affect your frontal lobes? Yes. Yes. And Primarily. it's your frontal lobes that communicate with God. So when you destroy your frontal lobes, you're destroying your channel of communication with God. Mm -hmm. And you can become an ungodly person. That's the only really method God has to communicate with you. So your what's right up front here. Oh. So it would not be good for kings to drink because they need to communicate with God and have a clear mind, right? Yes. For who? Kings. Kings. Well, here's, here's, right. here's Proverbs 31, which we're, Bob is trying to move us ahead of our lesson here. It says, listen, Lemuel, kings should not drink wine or have a craving for alcohol. Um, when they drink, they forget the laws and ignore the rights of people in need. How about politicians that, that, that make laws that you mm -hmm. press the peons? Alcohol is for people who are dying. For those who are in misery, let them drink and forget their poverty and unhappiness. Is that the voice, we, the, the well, verse we ought to be quoting? That would be our inner city ministry. We're going to we're gonna open saloons <laughs> and give them drink, or maybe how about the medical marijuana, mm -hmm. but how are we going to finance it? Yeah. So then we go to Deuteronomy 14, yeah. take the tithe and buy strong drink with it and do, rejoice, rejoice before, before the Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Now that with that thing, that collection of littles, you've made no not made nonsense. I'd made nonsense. The first eight verses of Proverbs twenty three, which we don't have time to read right now, talks about the problems of eating with someone that you're not don't really know very well, or or taking advantage of the rich, or and and watch out for be greedy people, and so forth and so forth. Um, for example, starting with verse 6, Proverbs 23, verse 6, Don't eat at the table of a stingy person, or be greedy for the fine food he serves. Come on and have some more, he says. But he doesn't mean it. What he thinks is what he really is. By the way, that's a fairly familiar verse. As a man thinks in his heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You will vomit up what you have eaten, and all your flattery will be wasted. That what are we supposed to learn from a verse like that? Got me. Well, just remember it, because if it happens to you, you'll understand it. Well, morbid obesity, <laughs> which is becoming epidemic in the developed world, has terrible health consequences. Beyond hypertension, diabetes, back and knee problems, those who are morbidly obese have a greatly increased risk of heart attacks, strokes, even cancer. Is God trying to warn us against that kind of stuff? We don't have any pictures of King Solomon, not even any drawings, as far as I know. We don't know about his eating habits. We don't know if he was morbidly obese or not. But he suggested, if you read the original Hebrew, eating too much is like putting a knife to your throat. What does that pl imply? Sounds like he had some pretty good idea about some of the consequences of overeating, huh? I think so. Do you know anybody whose life has been ruined by either their own or somebody else's overindulgence in either alcohol or food? I know a man who wanted to lose weight, so what he did, he went in and he got his stomach um, stapled or cut. Stapled cut. So he only can eat like a cup of food now. And mm -hmm. he, I mean, what is this thing that doctors have invented where they make your stomach like a little cup? So. Or they put some kind of band. I mean, it's the only way we can get people not to eat too much. No self-control. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we come to some further down here in, in Proverbs, uh, expanding on what we just talked about, Proverbs twenty-three, add these verses. What do you, what did he make of this? Look at Ezekiel thirty-three, verse eight. If I announce that an evil person is going to die, but you do not warn him to change his ways so that he can save his life, then he will die, still a sinner, and I will hold you responsible for his death. What do we do with that? Look at 1 John 3, 4. You know what sin is. Whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law or sin is 
lawlessness if you take the original language. Uh, what about Romans 14.23? Uh, but if you have doubts about what you eat, if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith and anything that is not based on faith is sin. What do we do with that? That's another definition of sin. That one's a little hard to understand. A little hard to understand? Yeah. Well, let's try another one. Um, I think we as Adventists are fortunate that we've got, we were shown healthier ways to e eat. Mm -hmm. And if we don't pass that on to others, I can see how we might be held accountable. And that's why we have institutions and colleges and well, the, to teach this. The stuff they were eating during Ellen White's time, though, was atrocious compared to now. Well, you can still do a lot of damage to yourself these days. Yeah. But what did she eat that was atrocious? No, no, the times that people... Well, the oh, the, the times. Right. Yeah. The times are really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how long the people live. But, Every but here's another thing. Well, they were, and the way they, the way they lived long was by getting lots of exercise and being outside all the time and yeah. walking everywhere they went. And So now we're eating better but not exercising. Exactly. And we're dying just almost, well, not as fast, but almost. Mm. Have you ever tried to let a person know how they should eat? I mean, <laughs> I think I maybe <laughs> one in ten says thank you. The other nine are like, Literally. get away. Yeah. yeah, leave me alone. Well, people pay good money to learn from physicians how to live better. You just have to approach it in the right way and yeah. a limited dose at the time. You can get an overdose of anything, including right. knowledge. <laughs> and even health food. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Where are you going on your computer? Well, unfortunately, just now I've lost my. Um, is this your new my, super this duper? This is my new super duper computer that's not doing what I wanted to do. You're commanding, but it's not doing anything. That's right. So. Um, you need to Would you like an old-fashioned book? Hand me, hand me your, your <laughs> hand, ha, hand copy and let's go and tell. Meanwhile, I'll see if we can figure out where we're going here. You wanted to talk about sins of omission. Yes. So now it says we, we're talking about sins of commission. We've talked about those and everybody seems to understand at least something about that. Commission means Doing sins it. you actually do. Sins you actually do. Then other people talk about sins of omission. That's the ones you mentioned. What would a sin of omission be? Not warning the wicked men. Okay. Well, no, not doing something that's wrong. Not doing something that's right would be a sin of omission. If, if you know something needs to be done yeah. and you don't do it, that is a sin of omission that makes you guilty. And that's a problem for those of sensitive conscience. Okay. Because if you talk about only as sins of commission, you can make a checklist. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about sins of omission, mm -hmm. anyone of sensitive conscience can come up with a hundred new things every day that he should have done, but he, he didn't. He might have been able to do yeah. But now, he, this verse suggests that, you know, even if we don't warn people about the things that they shouldn't be doing, it's a sin. Yeah, that would be your sin of omission. You should have warned them, but you didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, that would be under that. And that would be James 4.17. So then those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. There's a little catch there, the good they know they should do. If you don't know you should do something. So it's all right. Yeah, because you can't, you don't know it. Okay. So isn't this omission stuff kind of a, a pretty big yoke on a person? Absolutely, um, especially those who believe honestly that they must be have perfect moral character, sinless perfection before Jesus comes. Yeah. Because if they paused a moment to think what they're talking about, it is so scary that we could scare ourselves to death right here and now. <laughs> okay, well, let, let me, when we, we need to come <laughs> to a conclusion here because we're running out of time. A terrible example happened a few years ago in New York City. A woman was being attacked at night on a street. 
She cried out for help. Dozens of people heard her, yet not one person even bothered to call the police. Most people looked out the window. They went back to whatever they were doing. Soon the woman's cry stopped. Later she was found dead, stabbed numerous times. Were the people who heard her cries but did nothing responsible for her death? Though they hadn't attacked her herself, did their inaction kill her? Yes. Her name was Kitty Genovese. That's right. It was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. The newspaper said there were 38 witnesses. Turns out there were only about 10. None of them observed the entire attack. Yeah. Only two of them observed the initial attack, and one of those was drunk. So the story's not quite as bad as it's been depicted in the psychology books, but it was bad. Mm -hmm. It was a classic case of sins of omission. It's, it's I think we could, it, it happens every day in the U.S. It's still discussed. I saw, yes. uh, saw some uh, new stuff on that a while back. Still happens. Yeah. <coughs> okay. In conclusion, souls around us must be aroused and saved or they perish. Not a moment have we to lose. We all have an influence that tells for the truth or against it. I desire to carry with me unmistakable evidence. This is Ellen White speaking. Unmistakable evidences that I am one of Christ's disciples. We want something besides Sabbath religion. We need the living principle and to daily feel individual responsibility. This is shunned by many, and the fruit is carelessness, indifference, a lack of watchfulness, and spirituality. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 99. Talk faith, live faith, cultivate love to God, evidence to the world all that Jesus is to you. Magnify His holy name, tell of His goodness, talk of His mercy, and tell of His power. Our High Calling, page 20. How good are we doing? At, how good a job are we doing at witnessing? You've just mentioned several things, quoting Ellen White, and these all sound like good news to me. Who wouldn't want to give yeah. that news? I mean, it seems like that's we should be telling. We should be out there jumping on the street, shouldn't we? Saying Hallelujah! Let me tell you the good news. Or is that not the right way to do it? Uh, how come it doesn't happen then? Yeah. How come you don't do it? Well, they, that's the question we're asking, <laughs> and we're, we're running out of time. Let me read you another one. Everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Do we do that? Truth is of God. Deception in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. And whoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. There's a lot of things we can learn from this portion of Proverbs. And we've just discussed a few of them. Good luck with looking at your version of that passage. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for being with us through this session, for helping us to discuss these things. There are so many issues in these lessons, it's hard to even focus on one thing. But we thank you for being with us. We thank you, thank the work, the Holy Spirit for his work and the work of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name, amen.